All right, we will start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The act of faith, oh my God, I firmly believe that thou art one God and three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I believe that thy divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because thou hast revealed them, who canst neither deceive nor be deceived. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Our Lady, Seed of Wisdom, pray for us. St. John Joseph of the Cross, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right. Please be seated. So, uh, today, as we continue our series on, Protest on, on, excuse me, on heresies, we're going to continue on Protestantism, and especially I'm going to focus on King Henry VIII and the English schism, because it was more a schism, at least at first, than a heresy. And... Uh, also, we'll talk a little bit more about just the whole Protestant movement, and so we'll wrap it up today. Next class, I hope to go on to, because we're basically following a chronological order, so the next major heresy would be Jansenism, after we finish Protestantism. But before we get into King Henry VIII and Anglicanism, we're going to once more visit what we talked about last class and just kind of summarize that Martin Luther was excommunicated in uh, 1520. He, he uh, made that famous act of defiance, nailing his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany, Germany in 1517. But 1520, excommunicated, and by Pope Leo X, um, and, uh, and, but it was, you know, too far done. I mean, that Protestantism was already beginning to spread, and his ideas were spreading. Now, we talked about Martin Luther's main ideas, and that was faith alone saves a person, which another meaning is you don't have to have good works. You don't have to obey the commandments. Uh, so I'll say no need for works. Just faith alone saves a person. And he also taught the Bible alone. There's no need for a church. There's no need for church authority. And he taught private interpretation of the Bible. You don't need a church, an authority over you, to interpret it, you can interpret it yourself, and the Holy Ghost will inspire you for the correct interpretation. Um, all, all of that because he rejected the church. But almost immediately, there began to be other reformers who had different opinions than Luther. And we'll talk about a few of them this evening. But I also want to mention, getting back to this main premise that faith alone saves the person, you don't need good works. To me, it is so such a matter of common sense. If you think about the entire Bible, everything Christ stood for, he was constantly telling people to do the will of, of the Father. And he himself, his whole purpose was to do the will of his Father. And if you read St. Paul, he talks about those who commit these, these crimes, you know, adultery and theft and blasphemy and on and on. And those who do these things shall have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Uh, and, you know, you think about it. Why would God even give commandments? Why would he tell us you have to live this way if you don't have to? If, it, if, this, if it's not necessary, all you have to do is believe. So the entire Bible is, is really pointless if all you have to do is believe. Insofar as, you know, 90% of the Bible, which talks about how we are to live. Um, so... Common sense would tell us that that has to be false. But this began to spread around Europe. But as I mentioned, others 
differed from um, Luther. Some of the early Protestant uh, reformers, as they were called, there was in Switzerland uh, John Calvin. And he started, you know, his followers were called Calvinists. There was another one named, I don't know his first name, Zwingli. And he doesn't seem to have started really a church so much. But Calvinism, Calvin went to Geneva and he set up basically a theocracy in Geneva, which means that the civil government was, he was like the dictator and he claimed to represent Almighty God and he did executions and things like that. So it was a state controlled religion in Geneva and basically draw, drove out all the Catholics that um, refused to, to convert to Calvinism. But Calvin brought something new to Lutheranism, to Protestantism. Calvin taught predestination. Now, there is, and I will, won't go into this, you know, it's a deep theological matter. There is a true understanding of predestination, which means that God gives to certain individuals graces beyond what he gives the common uh, human race, or, or that he gives to others. He chooses certain ones and gives them special graces. But the way Calvin taught predestination is that God created certain people who are going to go to hell, They've, that's already been determined, and there's nothing they can do about it. And they are predestined to damnation. And that's so contrary to our very concept of the justice of God, and especially his mercy. Uh, it says in scripture, God desires not the death of the sinner, but that he be converted and live. God desires the salvation of all men. But Calvin taught uh, that God... Uh, is going to damn certain people, and there's nothing they can do about it. So predestination. Now that idea was taken up by another Protestant reformer in Scotland, and his name was John Knox. And he started the Presbyterian religion. So, you know, before, in modern times, modern times, I mean, say, the last 40 years or so, uh, Protestant to, Protestants primarily belong to non-denominational churches, especially these big mega church churches, you know, real life or whatever they, you know, they, they all have their name. And some of them are very large, and they're typically referred to as evangelicals, but they're not members of the old line Protestant denominations. You think of Protestant denominations, you think of the Lutherans, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, uh, and, and so forth, and other you know, lesser known groups. So um, Knox took this idea of predestination that Calvin came up with, and he accepted it and taught it in Scotland. So in the British Isles, you have the Presbyterian church was primarily in Scotland. And they also called it Presbyterian because a presbyter is a priest and they don't have any bishops. Whereas in the Anglican Church, there are bishops. And before we get to Anglicanism, I, I do want to mention one more. And I don't remember, it seems we had a series of classes several years ago, so I probably have them on tape, you know, when we did the audio recording, where we went through different religions. And uh, we talked about the Anabaptists. And they were in Germany, and um, they were called Anabaptists because apparently this this word meant, or this little prefix meant the rebaptizers. And what they taught is that, as do the Baptists in the United States today, they taught that you can't baptize children as infants. You they shouldn't be baptized until they're at least say 15 years old. And where they can choose it and understand and want it. And so they would rebaptize uh, persons who had been baptized as infants. But that movement started in Germany. And again, I don't remember the, 
you know, the individuals who started it. But as with everything else, it began to splinter into other groups. And you know the Mennonites and the Amish, they they're come from that group, the Anabaptists. So they're, religion wise, they're, uh, they believe in the Baptist, this idea that you can't baptize children. Um, but they have their you know, unique practices uh, of um, resisting, I guess you might say, modern conveniences and modern inventions, especially the Amish, you know, where they don't drive automobiles, they still farm with horses and, and, and oxen and so forth, plowing the fields. All right, um, the, um, the Baptists in this country were started by a man named Roger Williams, seems was the beginning of the Baptist religion in this country, and I believe he was in Rhode Island. He started, he started the, um, the state, what we call Rhode Island Plantation. Um, so the state of Rhode Island begins with a um, Baptist. And then, of course, you have the Quakers, William Penn, who came to Pencil, started Pennsylvania. And what's interesting about the Quakers is that they called themselves the Friends. Okay, the, the official name of their church, I think it's the official name, the Friends, right? But people called them Quakers because they would have their meetings and they were into the kind of the kind of like the charismatics, you know, emotional, uh, uh, emotional state. But they, William Penn, and the other Quakers in Pennsylvania, they were the most tolerant of Catholics in the early colonies. Even Maryland, which was founded as a Catholic colony, once the Protestants had a majority, they began to restrict the Catholic practices in Maryland. But Pennsylvania was always, going back before the revolution, uh, Catholicism was allowed to grow and spread. So the first churches were, uh, although Baltimore probably, but also Philadelphia in this country. Okay, so I said we were going to talk about, that's basically it for the continental Protestants, meaning in you know the continent of Europe. But now we get off into the British Isles. And we already talked about John Knox, but there is what we would call the Anglican Church, although in England they call it the Church of England. So what happened there? We mentioned that um, that Martin Luther was excommunicated in 1520. And in 1521, Henry VIII wrote a book um, he authored a book defending the faith against Martin Luther. And what was interesting, and I think that was a correct year, um, he rejected Protestantism. He did not agree with Protestant uh, ideas. So he wrote against Luther, and the Pope gave him the title of defender of the faith, because he was. He, you know, it was it was well written. Uh, it was strong. It condemned the heresies of Luther. So Henry VIII was called defender of the faith, and even to his dying breath, he was not a Protestant. So his break from the church was more a schism. Now he maybe began to adopt some Protestant ideas, but for the most part, during his life. Lutheranism didn't come into England, but it did after after his death. So, um, what was his downfall? Well, his downfall, very simply put, was lust. Uh, King Henry VIII had married uh, a woman named Catherine of Aragon, so from Spain. And I believe, I don't remember all the details, but I believe that she was his brother's wife. And, uh, of course, for a man to marry his brother's wife after his brother dies, that would be an impediment. But it's an impediment of church law, not divine law. So, therefore, it can be dispensed by the church. The church can dispense from her own laws, and that's what the Pope did for him to marry Catherine of Aragon. Well, he got tired of Catherine, and so he became interested in one of her ladies-in-waiting who was Anne Boleyn. And I was reading this over the weekend. I want to see if I can find it. And it goes into the different wives. I think he ended up having six or seven different wives. Two of them he beheaded. He claimed they were unfaithful or whatever and had them beheaded. So um, 
pretty gruesome uh, uh, story or history there. Uh, there was Jane Seymour, and I, I don't remember all the names, but, but again, two of them beheaded. So um, Henry VIII's problem was lust, and he was not given his annulment. He appealed to the Pope to be able to, for the Pope to declare that his ma marriage with Catherine of Aragon was invalid so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. Well, the Pope refused because it was valid. She was his lawful wife. Uh, the church had granted him that dispensation which he needed to marry her. Now, um, you know, the Pope can't just turn around and say, well, I I'll annul it because an annulment means it wasn't valid from the beginning. But once the annulment was given, he married her. That was a valid marriage. So he repudiated Catherine of Aragon and married Anne Boleyn. I think her name is spelled E-Y-N, Anne Boleyn. At any rate, that didn't last very long. He got interested in someone else, rejected her. Altogether, I think there were six marriages. So Henry VIII, um, six different women that he married. And as I mentioned, two of them, he just, he beheaded. Uh, the others, he just he just repudiated them and married someone else. Now, of course, someone who wrote a book defending the faith, how do you pacify your conscience? You're living in this way. Well, he got a bishop who was very subservient to him to come to England, and this bishop had actually been, um, I don't remember the whole story, exiled from England because of his heresies. This bishop had become uh, Lutheran in his thinking, very Protestant. So Henry VIII welcomed him back to England because he approved of his uh, marriage with Anne Boleyn. And his name was Thomas Cranmer. So Cranmer is the one that brought into England Protestant ideas because Henry VIII himself didn't believe in you know, the Bible alone and all of that. What Henry VIII claimed was that since he was the king in England, he was the head of the church in England. So um, I'll put that up here. Henry VIII claimed to be the head of the church in England. And to this day, sovereigns in England claim the title of um, Defender of the Faith, which the Pope gave him, which is interesting because they reject the Pope, but they claim that title of Defender of the Faith and Head of the Church in England. Um, and we'll get into you know, Anglicanism and as it spread, but um, in, in England, they call it, as I said, the Church of England. We would typically refer to it as the Anglican Church. But in this country, it's called the Episcopalian Church. So if you hear of Americans who are Episcopalians, then that means they come from, they follow the Church of England. Episcopalians. And notice that word Episcopus, which means a bishop, because John Knox didn't like the idea of having bishops, so he called his movement the Presbyterians. Well, then there was someone else in England that started a group and didn't want bishops or priests, and they were called Congregationalists. And the first pilgrims that came to Plymouth Rock, and they were Congregationalists. They were from England, and they were being persecuted in England because they wouldn't uh, be part of the Church of England, and so they came to America. But they were Congregationalists because they believed that each congregation was autonomous and supreme, and they could elect whoever to be their minister, and they didn't have any kind of ordination, anything like that. So Cranmer um, then wrote uh, a new book for um, the sacraments, etc., and it was approved by King Edward VI. So this is what happened in England. You had Henry VIII and he reigned from 1509 to 1547. He died in January 1547. Well, the way the laws were at that time, he had one son he had at least a couple of daughters. 
Well, the son was from Jane Seymour, one of his wives. And, but he became king after, um, after Henry, his father. And he was called Edward VI. And Edward VI was born in 1537. He became king in 1547 because, you know, upon the death of his father. He wasn't even 10 years old. He was just over nine years old, nine years and a couple months when he was made king. And he died in 1553. Now, so for six years. Well, when you have a boy that dies, you know, becomes king when he's nine and dies when he's 15 years old, he's not going to be running the kingdom. You have a regent. You have, you have someone that's oftentimes maybe his mother or whatever. And I don't know who that was. But the point is, during his reign, this is when Cranmer railroaded through whatever he wanted to do. And so the England became, they were schismatic under Henry VIII when he broke with Rome, which was in 1535, I believe. Now it became Protestant in teaching due to Cranmer and other uh, reformers. Well, after he died at a young age, like I said, he was 15 years old, 15 or 16, um, he was succeeded by Queen Mary. Now, Mary was the daughter of Henry VIII and his true wife, Catherine of Aragon. So she was really the legally, she should have been the sovereign after Henry VIII. And what Mary did is that she reunited England to the Catholic Church. Uh, her reign was 1553 to 1558, so five years. And there was a cardinal from England, Cardinal Reginald Pole, who was sent by uh, the Pope to reunite Catholics, you know, to absolve them of their schism and so forth and reunite England to the Roman Catholic Church. And that's what happened under Queen Mary. Now, uh, you know what she's called by historians, Bloody Mary. There's even a popular alcoholic drink called a Bloody Mary, right? With like tomato juice in it. So she is referred to as Bloody Mary, and I'm sure she did execute certain people. But it is nothing like her successor. And after she died, did she die a natural death? Or was she executed? I, I didn't have time to look that up. But at any rate, she was only the queen for five years. After her, her half-sister, Elizabeth, became the sovereign. Now, Elizabeth, which now we would, would go by Elizabeth I because there was a second who just died, what, a year or two ago. But Elizabeth was um, reigned from 1558 to 1603. And so a long reign. I mean, 47 years, I think. 46, 47 years. And she ruthlessly suppressed Catholicism, both in England and in Ireland. And she is really the one that should be called Bloody Elizabeth. She was, um, uh, she was ruthless in rooting out, trying to root out Catholicism. There were many, many martyrs at the time of Elizabeth. Now, she was so bad. So here you had this brief reunion with Rome under Queen Mary, and now it all went to heck under Elizabeth. You know, this totally enforced Protestantism. Well, um, because of her crimes, at a certain point, she was excommunicated by Pope St. Pius V. Now, Pope St. Pius V was Pope from, I think, 1565 to 1572, thereabouts. He uh, had a glorious reign, accomplished so many things. Of course, we think of the Battle of Lepanto, the Quo Primum Bull in the Roman Missal. So he reformed the Missal, the Breviary, uh, enforced the decrees of the Council of Trent, etc., and obviously was a saint, very holy man. But he uh, excommunicated her for her crimes and absolved Catholics from allegiance to her. Well, many historians say that that was an imprudent or an unwise decision on his part because that just excited her wrath, her anger against the Catholic Church, and and you know it just became much more the persecution, much more bloody, much more gruesome, etc. 
Many Catholics were put to death, many priests. Uh, you know, you think of saints, uh, or beat they're beatified mainly, like Edmund Campion, uh, Margaret Clitheroe, different ones under Elizabeth. And uh, at that time, their Catholics, who didn't go to the anchorhead services, they would be um, they would be fined with very heavy fines, and so it kind of forced a lot of Catholics, not that it's any justification, to finally just give in. But those who remain Catholic, they uh, would have to pay the fines, etc. And before Henry VIII, or I could say at the beginning of his reign, there were numerous monasteries in England. Numerous monasteries, uh, church lands, church um, institutions of different kinds, monasteries, convents, etc. So all of that was taken away from the Catholic Church and um, distributed to high-ranking, you know, Protestant uh, nobles, etc. So all the goods of the church basically taken away. So as as this historian that I was reading over the weekend said. Uh, that Henry VIII's downfall was lust and greed. But I don't know how much Henry VIII really wanted the monastery. Certainly a lot of the nobles who went along with him did. Now, Cranmer, as I mentioned, came out with a new, um, well, a book, prayer book called the Book of Common Prayer. But there was also a book of the form for the sacraments. And it was called the Edwardan Ordinal. It was called the Edwardan because Cranmer came out with it when Edward was king and he signed off on it. So the Edwardan Ordinal. So an ordinal is like a missal or a you know a sacramentary a book with the different forms. Now there was a discussion about this over the centuries. And uh, several popes commented on it and ruled that um, Anglican orders were invalid. So that was three different popes had ruled on that. But it wasn't a sort of uh, final, once-for-all, solemn type of teaching. So Pope Leo XIII, in 1896, came out with an apostolic constitution called Apostolice and uh, the gist of it was Anglican orders are invalid. So Anglican priests and bishops today, uh, they don't have valid orders, whereas the Eastern Orthodox do. And he goes through the reasoning in this apostolic constitution. But what's really great about it is not only that he decided that once for all, but he went through the theology of the sacraments. He just talks about the purpose of the sacraments, the signification of sacraments, what we call the res sacramenti. So a Catholic theology, it's an excellent treatise explaining Catholic theology on the sacraments. But what they found, those researchers, etc., those who helped him uh, do the research and writing it, is that all the Anglican orders go back to one bishop, and his name was Matthew Parker. So, you know how a bishop would trace his lineage as far as he can. So, you know, Bishop Piverunus would say, I was consecrated by Bishop Carmona, who was consecrated by Bishop Took, and then you could go on beyond that as, as far as you would have, uh, you know, records. Well, any Anglican bishop today, or at the time of Leo the Thirteenth, would have to trace their succession of orders back to this one man. And so that made it easy for Pope Leo XIII. And he determined that Matthew Parker was an invalid bishop because of the form in this Edwardan ordinal that Cranmer came up with, which was not a valid form. So he ruled that Anglicans do not have valid orders. But what's interesting today, the Anglicans have had for some time, I don't know how long, uh, women priests and women bishops. Um, and they have a, the head bishop is called the Archbishop of Canterbury. But he doesn't have authority 
over the other Anglican bishops in the same way that a pope would have authority over Catholic bishops. But he's like given the, the primacy of honor, not a primacy of authority, just given honor as being the Archbishop of Canterbury. His name now is a wealthy, I think. But Canterbury is, has always been, before Henry VIII, kind of the, the primatial see of the church in England. The primary see and that is the the city where Thomas of Becket was the bishop he was the Archbishop of Canterbury and you can go to the Cathedral and I've been there you can go to the Cathedral in Canterbury today and they show you the exact spot where Thomas of Becket was murdered and uh, that brings up another side point interesting and again, I, I didn't have enough time to research this. How much was due to Henry VIII, or how much was after he died? But one of the things they did in England is they destroyed Catholic shrines. So a big thing in England during the Middle Ages before Henry VIII was pilgrimages. Well, because of the English Channel, you'd have to take a boat. It was harder for people in England to go to Rome, or to go to the Holy Land, or to go to Compostela as many Catholics in continental Europe did. So a big thing was visiting the shrine of Canterbury where Thomas of Becket was martyred. You even have a famous book or famous work called The Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. And the whole gist of it is there's a group of people on pilgrimage and they're stopping at an inn along the way and telling stories. You might say swapping stories. So that's how he writes The Canterbury Tales. But many people would, would go on pilgrimage to Canterbury to venerate the spot where Thomas of Becket was martyred. Well, again, it was either Henry VIII or one of his successors. They exhumed the body, burned it, and dumped the ashes into the river just to eliminate it. You can go today to St. Paul's Cathedral in London, and you can see the statues on the outside of the cathedral that are broken off, they're beheaded or broken off, and that was done by the Protestants, either under Henry VIII or shortly after him, uh, to, to eliminate the idea of statues. So, um, you know, they, they obviously they took over all the Catholic churches, what had been Catholic churches, and made them Church of England, Anglican churches. When the hierarchy was reestablished in England with Cardinal Wiseman by Pope Pius IX, I think 1860s or thereabouts, um, they had to build a cathedral, and so that's in Westminster. Um, cathedral of Westminster is the Catholic cathedral, the main cathedral of Catholicism. And, of course, from the time of Elizabeth up until that time when the hierarchy was reestablished in England, Catholics were basically persecuted and, and in hiding and that type of thing. Now, thinking about the Anglican Church today, um, there, uh, there has been uh, a fracturing, as happens in all the Protestant churches, uh, of, the, of the different the people in England. As a matter of fact, this book that I was reading, he quotes from an Anglican who says, we have no unity in our church. And this was an Anglican priest or you know, an upper educated person because there, there isn't any. So the Anglican Church today, uh, they have what they call the High Church. They have the Low Church. And they have the Broad Church. And so what those terms mean is the High Church Anglican. So if you go, you go to a church that's the priest, the Anglican clergyman, Anglican priest, is of of high church thinking, then it's going to be similar in ceremonial to Roman Catholicism. Uh, they use incense, they'll use vestments, etc. So that's the high church. I'll tell you another story about that in a minute. The low church is like Protestantism. It's just basically like Lutheranism, many of the same ideas, etc. And then you have the broad church in between. So my story was, I was in New Zealand years ago, like 30 years ago, more than that, 35 years ago, and someone came up to me after a lecture with a book and wanted me to, is this book okay? 
and I was looking at it as a prayer book, and I always looked for an imprimatur, and I couldn't find one. And interestingly, it had the mysteries of the rosary, it had the stations of the cross, and it had many prayers that we might use. But there was something wrong, and I kept looking, and I finally found it. It was an Anglican book. So that's the high church. Now, this started, especially uh, in the 1800s, there was a movement called the Oxford Movement, because it started in Oxford, which is just a little bit outside London, kind of the premier university in England. Um, they started this movement, and the movement was to bring back the Church of England to Roman Catholic practices. And they came up with a theory, and they, and they called it the branch theory. And the branch theory said that the church Christ founded is like the trunk, the Christian church. And it has branches. And the Roman Catholic Church is one branch. And the Eastern Orthodox Church is a branch. And the Anglican Church is another branch. So they say, you know, we're different from Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodox or others. But we're still, part, we're still a branch from the trunk of the, the church that Christ founded. And, of course, that's false. Um, you know, Pope Pius XII, in his masterpiece encyclical called Mystici Corpus and the Mystical Body of Christ, says the Church of Christ is the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church is the Church Christ founded. It's, you can convert those two sides of that equation. The Roman Catholic Church, Church founded by Christ, and vice versa. Um, and, and so th this was just an attempt to justify themselves in remaining Anglican. Now, there have been many famous Anglican converts, and um, the Oxford movement, even though it was an attempt to say that we're legitimate, you know, we, we, are, we are from Christ, even though we're, we're separate from the Roman Catholic Church, we can trace ourselves, we still are, you know, a branch of the Christian Church, etc. And so most of those in this Oxford movement remained Anglican. That was their, they're trying to justify remaining Anglican. Well, it did lead to many converts. Um, one of the most prominent was Cardinal Newman, John Henry Newman. Now, Newman uh, was made a cardinal towards the end of his life, and he never became a bishop. I think he was a priest, but he was a prominent Anglican convert. Another very prominent one was uh, Monsignor Robert Hugh Benson. And what's interesting about Benson, a number of books, very fascinating, and he died at a, at a relatively young age. I think he was in his mid to upper 30s or so. But he was the son of the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Archbishop, who's the head Archbishop, he was his son. And he became a Roman Catholic priest. Um, Faber was a convert. I don't remember all of them, you know, right now. But there were many famous, wonderful Catholic converts from Anglicanism. In this country... There was um, the, we, we have the Chair of Unity Octave in January, and that was started by Father Paul Watson. Well, Paul Watson was an Anglican clergyman. He converted to Roman Catholicism, went to a seminary, and was ordained then a true Catholic priest. But he was a convert from Anglicanism. So there have been many, uh, you know, over the years. But that idea of the, the different branches, etc., and different groups in Anglicanism shows the lack of unity. Now, I mentioned Canterbury. Canterbury is probably by car, I think it's about two-hour drive south and east, primarily east of London. But when St. Augustine of Canterbury was sent to England by Pope Gregory the Great with uh, like 20 monks or so from the monastery where in Rome, when he went there, that's where they settled, and, and the king of Kent, as it was called at that time, he was converted, in, and so they established their first church there in the town of Canterbury, but it's much smaller, very small compared to London, but still, that's where the first, you know, bishop took up his residence and so forth, so Canterbury had that, that dignity. 
but that's why the head bishop of the Anglican Church is always the Archbishop of Canterbury. But it, and it's a beautiful uh, cathedral, old you know cathedral, still like it was at the time of St. Thomas of Becket. Another little interesting tidbit about bishops of Canterbury, there was one named, I think, Stephen Langston, and he was a Catholic bishop before Thomas of Becket, you know, around 1000 or 1100 or so. And he's the one that wrote the verses for the Bible. I mean, numbered all the lines in the Bible. And you know how people quote chapter and verse. It was Catholic bishops, Catholic writers, and it was another Catholic who divided the books of the Bible into chapters. And I don't remember his name, but uh, I think Stephen Langston was the name of the Bishop of Canterbury who went through and numbered all the verses, and, and it's used to this day by both Catholic and non-Catholic, and of course it's a good reference to be able to identify a quote from Scripture. But England had a wonderful Catholic uh, culture and history up to the time of Henry VIII. And what's interesting about the, the schism of Henry VIII is that, you know, you could think about this. The Pope could have saved that country for the Roman Catholic Church by just giving in to Henry VIII and giving him his annulment. And I, I've heard this quote that a pope said to, you know, Henry would send his ambassadors to Rome, etc. And he said, he said, if I had two souls, I might lose one of them for Henry, because I'd still have another one to say, but I only have one, and I'm not going to throw it away just to give in to Henry. So the church uh, did not want it, but that was the right thing to do, to refuse the annulment. There was no grounds for it. And so we lost, you know, the Roman Catholic Church lost this nation, basically, at least for several hundred years. Although, um, like I said, when, when the hierarchy was reestablished in the mid-1800s, a lot of, there were a lot of converts in England. A lot, a lot of them came back and, you know, like you read Father Faber, just wonderful writings. I mean, he wrote hymns that we use, like Faith of Our Fathers, etc. He was just an outstanding theologian and writer, and um, so many others as well. But um, this is a sad, sad fact of history. The Anglican uh, schism from the Roman Catholic Church, and it all was Henry VIII wanting to repudiate his wife, wanting to remarry. And so he had, he, his final decision was, well, if the Pope won't give me a moment, I'll declare myself head of the church in England. And of course, if you've seen the movie Man for All Seasons on the life of St. Thomas More, he refused to sign the oath of subjection or oath of submission, but the nobles and the priests and bishops had to sign this under threat of being put to death if they didn't sign it. And his conscience told him he couldn't do that. The only bishop that I know of that refused to sign it was John Fisher, and he's a saint. He was also executed, as was Thomas More. St. John Fisher. So um, at least there were, there were great uh, saints and martyrs. Interesting little tidbit. I, when I was in London many years ago, actually, 1996 to be exact, um, I visited the Tower of London, which is the, the big prison there. And there's only one person who ever escaped from the Tower of London. The security is so tight, etc. He was a Catholic priest, a Roman Catholic priest. And somehow they smuggled a rope into him and he tied it on the inside in it and he was able to you know go down the rope in and i don't know if they had a boat waiting because it's right on the, the river the thames river so i don't know if they had a boat waiting for him but he escaped the, the a catholic priest because you know priests were put in prison or executed etc and you know one of the things they talk about like again Bl bloody mary that they call the catholic queen bloody mary have you ever read how they executed the Catholics, like Edmund Canty and Wood, they would hang them, but not until they were dead. Like they're suffocating, and then they would cut them down. They would cut them open and burn their entrails in front of them while they're while they're alive. They would hang, hung, drawn, and quartered is what they would do. I mean, absolutely gruesome and a torture. And they're supposed to be, you know, the Protestants are supposed to be so civilized and so forth. So it's a, um, you know, interesting. Facts of history. All right, we are done with Protestantism. Our next class will be, I couldn't do Thursday this week, which is why we have the Tuesday class, but we'll be Thursday in two weeks. So that's the 21st of March. It'll be a Thursday uh, 